Now I have here today for you this morning, Emily Hansen. She is here from Portland State University. She is, the camp, she is one of the campus audiovisual event coordinators. And today she's gonna to talk about managing AV events on campus. Emily Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Uh, that's actually the perfect person to introduce me for this. Brian hired me as a student employee almost seven years ago now um, to work on the classroom AV services team. Well, okay. Um, back when I was Brian's student employee, we did not have many installed gear in our classrooms. We primarily had uh, small classroom setups that maybe would have an MLC panel or an installed screen. Um, this is actually an example of one of our classrooms after an upgrade. Uh, so primarily our job was to um, rent out gear for classroom services. Uh, so we would stage lots of projectors and things on carts and such for people to check out. Um, at the time, we also allowed rental of gear for student groups for their own events. We'd stage stuff on a cart and just send it out and hope it would work. Uh, before I get any further into this presentation, though, I am curious, how many of you have dedicated AV event teams on your campus? Does anyone? Could any of you explain sort of how that works for you? If anyone wants to chime in here. Hi, I'm from the University of Oregon. Um, the AV event services group is not part of, of our group, the, uh, the Center for Media and Educational Technologies. They're a separate group as part of the student union, and they do everything. Uh, they charge for everything they do. We, do. we support the classrooms, and so it's, it's just it's kind of completely different. However, we just recently hired away from their, one of, from their group one of uh, their best people, and he now works for us. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of a combination that we're going to now, and, and we're starting to talk about better collaboration. We have a conferencing services department with students that work there and a director of the conferencing services department. Um, Dan and I also do a lot of setup and take down for events uh, because we install the classroom technology, so we're like the guys that know the projectors. And then I have a five, six, student workers that will go and set up projectors and plug in audio and stuff, and that's just all free. It's part of what we do. At uh, Western Washington University, um, it's kind of similar to what you mentioned, uh, kind of two parts. We have the student, Viking Student Union, and they have their own crew and their own scheduling, and um, uh, I run the uh, classroom services and equipment loan. We have a large fleet of portable gear. So we'll get called in when they run out of gear or uh, they don't like to do events outside of their complex. So we cover the whole campus and I've got like 14 students, uh, not at the same time, but <laughs> in my staff. And um, uh, we basically take it in and um, as a reservation, deliver, set up, train, stuff like that. Okay. Anybody else have anything to add on how events are handled? We don't have to pass it. We're close enough. We can. Um, at, at Oregon State University, the uh, well, yeah, we have a, we have an events crew. It's mostly Raul is part of that for the streaming part of it. It's mostly um, distribution of events and some AV setup. We have um, uh, three large event entities on campus. We've tried to install as much equipment in those events as possible, so we're not lugging equipment back and forth. So it's really become more of a um, distribution of events through streaming or video conferencing. We also do the board shows for all athletics as part of the team, so it's a pretty encompassing group. But we've tried to put equipment in as many uh, places as we can, so we're not dragging stuff back and forth. Mm -hmm. all right. Anything else to add? So back when um, I was still with Classroom Navy Services, our model was much similar to what you're talking about. We had a team called Ox Services. They were primarily located in, in our student union called Smith Memorial Student Union. Um, and they would handle all the setup of all of the gear. They had a small pool of AV gear they'd bring into the room, but there isn't any installed gear in any of the event spaces either. But um, at some, this was what, about uh, 2010 or so, we had this project, we called it Operation Grand Slam. We got a bunch of one-time funding, and we put it all towards upgrading our general access classrooms and making them high-tech spaces. So the class tech podium you saw next door, we have one of those in just about all of our classrooms with a computer, DVD, VCR player, or a Blu-ray now, and a document camera as well as installed projector screen and speakers. So when that happened, um, AV's role changed slightly. We no longer had to rent out so much gear. It was more of a um, 
support model where I kept asking people if they tried turning it off again, or I'd have to run to the space. We weren't really checking out gear as much. And so it really opened up our ability to offer higher level support for our events. This is an example of one of our big first notable events. I'm sure you all recognize who that is. George Takei came to campus. Uh, this luckily was in one of our lecture halls that had installed gear, which made it much easier for us to support. This was one of the first big events that we were really called upon to handle. Like I said before, there was an aux services team. Uh, they aren't technicians. They handle all of like the furniture setup as well. So it was uh, decided by a higher entity in the university that maybe instead of letting them handle all of this AV equipment that they were not trained on at all, maybe they should hand it all over to us and see if we could do a better job with it. Um, and one thing that was really integral to that transition happening is a coworker of mine who was just very interested in event support and really wanted to create a better model for how we were going to handle them. So um, all of the AV gear that Aux Services had was handed over to us. It was mainly portable gear. Like I said before, we didn't have installed gear in our event spaces beyond a few installed screens. Um, we also have a variety of distance learning classrooms that we charge for use and we were able to use the income from that to buy some gear for uh, Cabot to get started. Uh, so this is our organizational structure at the moment. Um, you see at the top there we got Doug McCartney in the back, he is our master and commander. To the side we have Mark Walker, who I'm sure you all know. He handles only the labs and classrooms. So when um, it was decided that a AV team would be separate from classroom, we split off from Mark, unfortunately. And we created our own team, which is there off to the right. That's my team, um, and on the left we have our two separate AV teams. We have a triage team and then the actual technician team that actually installed the gear. So my team is there on the right. We call ourselves Cavit, the campus audiovisual event team. I have two other full-time AV technicians that work with me as well as a full-time videographer. We have two student managers that average about 20 hours a week each, and then a student support team that ranges anywhere from eight to 15 students depending on the term. So when we first formed, back in 2011 or so, there was only one full-time staff member who had to handle all of the events. Um, we had one full-time videographer who was really mainly supporting distance learning classrooms, but then also doing events on the side. It was kind of messy at first. There were two student managers, I was one of them, and then we actually shared our employee pool with uh, Brian's team, with the classroom AV team, meaning that sometimes students were pulled in the event direction, other times they were pulled to support classes. Did not work at all. There was always um, problems going on with students not being available when they were really needed. Uh, I would actually work with the AV student manager to try and schedule students at different times so that we would have one student who was dedicated solely for event support and then two students just for classroom support, but they all sat at the same desk. So a client would walk in and say, hey, my classroom has a problem, you need to come and fix it. The event person couldn't say, sorry, I'm only supporting events. They would go and have to help out. It was just confusing the clients and it really wasn't working out very well for us. So Cabot split off from AV. We now have our own employee pool, like I said, about eight to 15 student employees. Um, and we are fully separate from classroom AV services now. So we have our own desk, our own office actually at this point. Um, and we are still doing our best to educate people the difference between AV services and Cabot because no one can ever figure out the acronyms. Um, like I said before, we have about three full-time staff members. Our responsibilities range from student training, meeting with clients, um, gear maintenance, in this case, uh, saying goodbye to old gear. Um, we also oversee the setups of our more complicated events, and we spend a lot of our time looking into um, research of gear, as well as professional development. We go to conferences like this, Infocom. We're kind of all over the place. Our hours shift depending on what is needed each day. Um, we support events everywhere on campus. We are not restricted to any specific building. Um, this includes the University Place Hotel. Uh, PSU did buy a hotel a while back. It's a similar story as with the Ox Services. They had their own AV team. They were not technicians. There were a few problems that happened and we were asked to take over. And I'm now the primary uh, contact person for any events at the University Place Hotel. We have a separate pool of gear there, but essentially it is handled the same as anywhere else on campus. We just handle um, setups anywhere they need to go. There's a list of some of our services that we offer that's pretty vague. Basically, we'll do anything if we can. Uh, our scope is always increasing. We're always open to try new projects if we can handle it. Uh, but there's a brief list of some of the things we do. So we have a main office that is now separate from uh, Classroom AV. Uh, we're open from 7 to 10 every day, Monday through Saturday, sometimes on Sundays as well, depending on our event load. 
We always have at least one student employee in the office at a, at a time. Um, that student is responsible for the setup and uh, support of all of the events that are happening. And this can range from anywhere from one to 20 events each day. If there are a lot of events, we have extra students that are there, but primarily there's just one person that is there and staff supports as necessary. We do also do a small amount of gear checkout. This is not something that we have really perfected at this point. Uh, we don't have a great method of handling it simply because we're so often called away from our desk to support events. So at this point, we're kind of in the process of always changing how we handle that. But that's just there so you know. Um, majority of our spaces are in our student union or in the hotel. There is very little installed gear in these spaces. There are two rooms with a very old MLC panel that's badly in need of updates. Um, unfortunately, we don't own that gear, and we've been pushing for an upgrade. Hopefully, in the next year or so, we'll see a newer panel go in. Um, we do have screens and speakers in a sp few spaces, but aside from that, all of the events that we're supporting, we're bringing in the gear for it. We do have guest Wi-Fi, though, which is a new thing, so we no longer have to deal with uh, guest logins, which was a huge headache for our help desk. Another thing of note is that we do offer rental of our classrooms for external clients. At this point, they can be used free of charge, meaning anybody can walk on the campus and use our projectors all day, and we get absolutely no money for that. So we are working on a new model, which will hopefully be implemented the next fiscal year, where everyone will have to pay for the usage of the classrooms. And it'd probably just be a daily charge, and we're not really sure if that's going to apply to internal departments. But all of that money would go straight into our AV support team to purchase new gear and, uh, for upgrades as well. This is just a list of some of our gear. Uh, we're not really brand specific. We go all over the place. Uh, for our projectors, we use a lot of the episode short throws you can see there. There's a bunch of old Hitachis at the top that are probably going to be surplus soon. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a brief overview of some of our video gear. Our audio gear also um, similarly ranges. We, the only thing we really standardize on are Sennheiser wireless microphones, simply because it allows us to be compatible with the Sennheisers that are in our classrooms. And we just like the way that they work. This picture is from one of the first events that we ever had to really pull out all the stops on wireless microphones. This was uh, part of Obama's initiative to get students engaged in engineering courses. And so he sent several of his board members, or cabinet members, as well as uh, we had the CEO of GE and Intel, as well as a few other notable people. We had 12 wireless lapels in total in a feedback-prone space. We never had to handle that number before. You can even see we've got a mixture of old Sennheisers and new just to reach the limit that we needed to. This was quite a handful. We also live streamed this on the White House website, which was exciting when one of the techs had to run on stage to adjust a mic. He got to say he was on the White House website. He was very proud. <laughs> Some of our other gear, we use fast fold screens like this one here. Um, for our live streaming at this point, we're using a Sony Anycast and a Terra Deck. Um, we do audio recording, really just with a Marantz or a Zoom. And our streaming currently is through Ustream, although we are looking at the possibility of YouTube, potentially. Yes? So this event, I would actually call this one of our mistakes. Uh, this is the dive-in movie. <laughs> And this event was started by an employee who no longer works with us, somebody who is heavily involved with the Student Rec Center. And he thought it'd be a great idea to show a movie for everyone who wanted to come and hang out in the pool. So they buy a bunch of pizza, and the students just kind of float around and watch this movie. Um, because it's a pool, you can't hear anything. We bring in speakers. You can't hear well. Yes? And if you look carefully, I'm also the prize <laughs> The biggest problem, though, with this, um, aside from the obvious, to get that screen up, we almost have to like lift it up over the pool at one point, which I didn't realize we were doing um, until a few years ago. We've been doing this for years now, and I'm just waiting for that screen to fall in the pool. That is our oldest screen, so I don't really care too much. It has like this big bow on the top of it. So when that thing falls, we're just done. We're never supporting it again. Um, and I've made that clear to the rec center. I'm hopeful that uh, I can push them in the direction of some installed gear or maybe an inflatable screen because obviously this human environment is not great for my gear. And I did mean to say earlier, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to jump in at any point. Thank you, Mark. So all of our services do have associated charges, including for our internal departments. All of our pricing is itemized and daily, aside from our videography and technician rates. You can schedule a technician to sit in the room and play your PowerPoint for you, or they'll run a full mixer, whatever it is you need to do, but that, that is hourly. 
Um, our pricing is all based on market prices. Every year we look over some of our competitors' rates and adjust things if necessary. So all of our external clients pay that full market value. Our internal clients, which is the departmental groups, they get half that price. And then student groups, because they complained a lot, they get a slightly lower rate on some of the most used items. At this point, our revenue is high enough that we are actually fully funded in terms of our student employment and our equipment purchases on our revenue costs. And our staff are partially funded on um, revenue. It's a mixture. So to manage all these events, we use EMS. I don't know if you've, any of you have heard of this. It's just event management system. It's just a database, um, but we share it with conferences and events. They're the team that's responsible for actually reserving the room as well as uh, the furniture and the setup. And then catering and Airmark are also in there as well. So this allows us to all be on the same page. The workflow that we use is on the bottom there, if you can read that. Um, conferences and events actually meets with the client, figures out their needs, and they make the room reservation. Sorry, do you have someone have a question? Or? Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when the room is reserved, conferences and events will ask the client if they have any need for AV services. If they do, they put in a reminder for us, which means when I open the database, this uh, dashboard pops up and says, hey, you need to call this client for this event. And so I contact them, figure out their needs, put the gear into EMS, and that handles all the tracking. At the end of the day, I can print off a report for my students that says, this is the gear that's needed for this event. Go deliver it. And then at the end of the event, um, all the billing is handled in EMS by my accountant. I don't have to touch it. I don't have to think about it. It's great. We, when we first started, we're actually using just Excel spreadsheets to track our invoicing, which, as you can guess, worked really well. We're very happy to be moving over to something like this. <laughs> all right. So some of our notable events that we've supported, um, this is actually Laverne Cox, although you can't see it very well. Um, from Orange is the New Black, if any of you watch that show. But um, some of our biggest events we support every year, we do support a, um, this annual Martin Luther King Day event. It's supported by our Diversity and Inclusion Office, and they try to get notable guest speakers every year. Uh, we get about 2,500 attendees in that gym. It is packed to the brim. There is an installed speaker in the gym. Unsurprisingly, it sounds like every other gym, so we do not use those speakers. We bring in our own audio system which is usually eight to 10 speakers on a delay. Um, the biggest problem we have with this is that there is never enough setup time. There's always a volleyball team or a basketball team in there for some inexplicable reason, and we can't get in to set up our gear. So our setup really changes depending on how much time we've been allotted or how many people we can actually get to come in and support it. Uh, the space is also very feedback prone, but luckily we've been able, we ha this is our new PreSonus digital mixer you can see in the picture here. With individual noise gating, this has been very helpful for us. Um, this is our, one of our videographers. I'm sure he'd be so pleased if he knew I was using this picture. <laughs> um, that is our big broadcast quality camera right there, our Panasonic 500. This is an example of some of our student training methods. That small camera, the little Panasonic, I think that's the 150 there, um, that is not being used to shoot an event of this size. We don't shoot on that small camera for this. Instead, we put a little student on there, and we just tell them, you're going to shoot this and pretend like you're going to give this footage to the client, and you're going to do a great job on it, but the footage never goes anywhere. It's just a training opportunity. We're all about tra training by fire. Just throw them in on the events. Just don't let them touch anything too important, and just kind of see how they handle it. Last year, we actually had Angela Davis speak at this event. The year before, we had Dr. Bernice King, who's Dr. King's youngest daughter. I was pretty exciting. When Bernice King was here, she actually brought along the Linda Hornbuckle Blues Band, and so we got to do a full band setup. Generally, we do not have the time for this, but we actually have all the gear to support doing musical events on this scale. This was really exciting for me. I love sound engineering, so we got to fully mic up a drum kit. This happens so rarely, <laughs> but it was very exciting. So that's just an example of some of the audio engineering that we can do. International Night is another annual event. This one is put on by the International Student Association. So the obvious challenge with this one is working with the students and figuring out what they actually want. And it's always hard to figure out who even to talk to. So I work pretty closely with the student group advisors who can kind of tie the students down and say, all right, you've made this decision. You have to stick with it now and also keep them a little bit more reasonable. This picture is from a few years ago. And we actually went a lot bigger than 
we normally would. We've got, there's two screens that you can see there. There's a third back behind the camera. Um, we also usually live stream this event, so we've got anywhere from one to two pairs of speakers in addition to the installed speakers in the space. Um, it's a pretty extensive setup. With this particular event, the student really wanted it to be a celebration. They wanted fireworks to be involved somehow. So I took a bunch of our old Hitachi projectors and just shot fireworks up on the ceiling, which was fun, and the students were very excited about it. Um, although it definitely increased our setup time for it. The biggest problem that we keep running into with these student groups is working out their budget approval. Like I said before, they do have to pay for all of their services. Students luckily are not allowed to authorize charges because we've run into some problems with that. So we now have a process in place where before anything happens, before any gear is left out in the room for a student, we send that quote to their advisor and the advisor has to email us back and say, yes, this is definitely improved. We don't have a really great process in place to ensure that that email does happen. It doesn't connect. We don't, there's no way to connect that with EMS to put like a hold on an event until the advisor has approved it. So we're still working on streamlining that process, but we have found that there has to be a few different measures in place so that the students don't get out of control, which they always try to. My Future, My Choice is the biggest videography project that we have ever taken on and possibly ever will. This was um, a video series that is Oregon's sexual education curriculum for middle school students. They had not updated this curriculum since the 80s. And so they came to us and they asked if we would be willing to reshoot it. And we initially said, that's ridiculous. We don't do stuff on that scale. You should ask somebody else. Because we primarily just live stream events or record events for people. We do a small scale video editing, but never anything on this scale. But the state really wanted us to do it. So finally we said, OK, fine, we'll do it. And the amount of money they paid us to do it allowed us to buy some of the gear we needed to pull this off. Um, one thing I should mention, the woman fit, uh, in that photo there, that's Erica. She was our director at the time. When this was happening, we had two full-time videographers. We could not have pulled this off otherwise. She was our primary director. Our other videographer was the assistant director. Between the two of them, they were able to manage this entire thing, but this was such a huge undertaking. Just saying that it was four months of production really does not grasp just how much work went into this thing. We didn't have to write the script. We weren't allowed to make any revisions to the script, but we did have to cast. We had to uh, pick locations. We were in charge of all other aspects of the production. So this is a pretty monumental undertaking. It's something we're all pretty proud of. It's standard curriculum in all public schools in Oregon. And given their track record, I assume that will continue for several decades until they need to upgrade it again. Some of the lingo in there, they wouldn't let us update it. It was so dated. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was very exciting. This is another picture of some of the production. We were shooting, all of our actors were around 14 years old which ended up being exceedingly awkward at times. We actually would ask the parents to wait in another room if they were okay with it, given the material that was being discussed. It was very strange, but we were able to get, um, we, we bought some nice boom mics. That was the main purchase that I remember for these projects. But we also had a variety of student videographers at the time that were fairly skilled, which really helped to make this happen. This is one of our other largest events that we no longer support. Commencement was held on campus. I don't know how many of you have been to the PSU campus. We don't have a big stadium. We don't have big spaces to hold something of this size. So for a few years in a row, we actually held it out in our park blocks, which is the, um, if you've ever been to Portland, there are the parks that run straight through downtown, and they run through campus as well. So we actually held our commencement out there. This photo doesn't at all grasp the scope of this event. We estimate there were at least 10,000 attendees there. There were tons more people off to the side. That tent is where the actual stage itself was, and all of these students uh, would sit up there in the front. Um, because of the size of this, the fire marshal shut us down. We stopped supporting it, coincidentally, the year that I graduated. I assume there's no correlation there. But um, we live streamed this, and we had a bunch of micro, uh, sorry, speakers that were distributed throughout this crowd. Obviously, there's not a ton of outlets out here. There were luckily enough that we were able to make it work, but the cable runs for this were just absolutely preposterous. This photo is taken from the third floor balcony of our student union. We actually got our internet feed through there. The camera was right where that tree is in the middle. We ran an SDI and Cat5 line from the camera to the third floor balcony for the connection. So we actually had a several hundred foot cable that we dropped off the balcony, we tied to that lamppost, we tied it to another tree and dropped it down the tree. 
And we all had to do that several days before, and then we just hoped no drunk college student would mess with it. And luckily, no one did. But that was one of the most insane setups we've ever had to handle. But it was, it was very exciting when we were able to pull it off. So we did this for a few years. Now commencement is held at the Rose Garden or the Moda Center, and so we don't really have any connection with it anymore, unfortunately. One thing that we did to help make this setup a little easier for ourselves, my coworker, who's a fan of uh, Photoshop and Google SketchUp, he actually made the entire diagram in Google SketchUp. This is just a still, but he actually made a video that follows the cable run throughout all the locations, and it included all of our students in all the different locations that they were assigned to. He actually imported photos of them, and you could see little pictures of them. And he dropped in the Bruce Springsteen band there. That, they didn't play our commencement. I don't know why he chose that band, but we did have a band there that was mic'd up that played Pomp and Circumstance. So I think I just flew through everything way fast. Oh, never mind. OK. So we have the SCAR conference as well that we've supported once. This was the um, Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. Um, they came to campus a few years ago, and they required 50 wired microphones around that U. And we tried to tell them that was just stupid, and they didn't want to listen. They wanted to have that many microphones on a U instead of any other configuration. So um, we were trying to find a way to do this without completely just having insane cable runs. None of our mixers can handle that many inputs, first of all. We max out at about a 24-channel mixer. Um, but also, just that we don't even have that many microphones. But what we do have is an interpretation booth, a very fancy one that's used by a Japanese interpretation class. And it uses IR to wirelessly transmit audio to both the microphones and the headset receivers. So we just stole that from the class and dropped it in here. So all of those microphones, they're just connected by IR. That cable you see running around the table, that's only for power. All the audio is distributed wirelessly. This was one of the first occasions where we actually had to rent gear. Generally, we only utilize our own gear. If we can't support something, we'll just tell somebody, you know, you might want to look at another company to support this. But we actually rented gear that would match the interpretation booth setup so that all of those mics, they were all the same model. And once we had that, it was amazingly easy to get everything set. I don't know if you've used an IR system before. They're very expensive, but they work very well once you get them all set, and they're very reliable. So that was really great. Uh, we also had four projectors all around the room. You can see one of our Panasonics there, as well as there were two TVs um, at the front. So. I just flew th through all that way too quickly. Does anyone have any questions or anything? Yes? You're located in a, in a heart of a major city. What Thank you. I forgot we had this. Uh, being you're in the heart of Portland, what do you guys do for your wireless microphone frequency coordination? Are you assigned certain bands? Or do it, does the SBE get involved? What's the situation on that? That is actually something that we've gotten really lucky at. We don't have specifically assigned bands. All of our microphones are in the five to 600 range. And somehow, we just haven't had as many problems with it as you would expect. There are a few locations that we do have issues. And we ended up buying um, some Sennheiser uh, paddle antennas to help with the actual connection to the microphones. But at this point, we have not had issues. I don't anticipate that continuing. I'm sure at some point, we're going to have some problems we have to deal with, especially if there's more frequency being sold off. But uh, no, we've gotten lucky on that one. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, more of a comment, really, but uh, don't use YouTube for your live streaming. Uh, content ID is live. Uh, so if anything happens to get across the system that happens to be copyrighted, you will be shut down through your, in the middle of your live event. Mm -hmm. You can try pre-clearing stuff, but uh, that works sometimes. Uh, you never know what your presenter is going to show and if he's playing a YouTube video uh, that, uh, that he shouldn't be playing or if he's playing some Pandora music before he starts speaking, you will get shut down. Yeah, we've actually run into that recently. A lot of our student groups, when we record their event, they want us to put it on YouTube for them. We always try and tell them, you know, you could probably put this on YouTube yourself as well if you want. We'll just give you the file, but we upload it for them. And um, yeah, event after event, it gets shut down. And we keep telling them in our pre-production meeting with the students, we always say, you can't use copyrighted material. And they're always like, oh, OK. And then just do whatever they want, because they're students. Um, so I was more, because we have a, PSU is a Google campus. And so I thought, because we have a YouTube channel, it would be nice to put certain, like, when our president is speaking, to have certain things on YouTube so that it's more tied in with our social media presence. 
but yeah, it's not something that I see us using for everything. Ustream is definitely a lot easier because, like you said, it's not going to shut anything down. Right. So with the, your student workers that go and do these AV setups, do you have like a, a training process at the outset? Do you have like a particular class and what does it look like? Yeah, that was something I meant to go into more detail. Thank you. Um, at this point, when we hire, we, use, we generally have such a small employee pool that when somebody is hired, we assess what their skills are, and then we just work one-on-one -on -one with them. And so we have a whole checklist that they have to go th work through, and until they have passed that checklist, they're not considered like a fully-fledged employee. They can't work shifts on their own. And so uh, we're actually in the process of training a new hire right now, and we just had his first few ships, shifts, we just have him work with the staff member. We'll do a few mock setups. We'll t kind of take him around campus and show him some of our gear and just kind of work with him. And once we have a feeling that he can handle basic aspects of the job, we'll tie him up with another student that we know can I instruct them. And so we just kind of drop them into a bunch of different um, situations to help uh, teach them. I had looked at having a D2L module that actually goes through all the, as all the things that they need to learn. Quite frankly, it just wasn't ever implemented well. Um, it's just because our staff are so frequently pulled in so many different directions, it was hard to have such a structured training module. So just saying instead, all right, when this person gets in, we're going to take them off for this event today. It's just changing constantly. We found that works better for us. And if there was to be any change in management, it probably wouldn't continue to work. We would probably need a more standardized module. But at least at this point, that's working. So it's, yeah, maybe, I think it's really just, um, a reflection of the personalities of the management of my team. We can handle that well. Yes, sir. Yeah, two, two things that I just want to point out about Emily's uh, presentation, excellent by the way, uh, is that uh, the evolution of this unit cap that coincided with our new president, uh, Dr. Vim Vivell. Uh, he is very presentation oriented. Uh, as a result of that and more interaction with our university communication department, events became more escalated on our campus. High profile events, student events, and everything. So providing a support unit on campus for them was is kind of necessary. And given that this came to me as almost an unfunded mandate, and I'm sure you've all heard that before, surrounded to events, is that we were able to keep tweaking it and moving it just to get it right, and then, you know, frankly, revenue created in one area helped out this area. This area is our growth area right now on campus as far as campus revenue goes. Uh, we need to keep investing money in equipment, and the staffing and the student staffing. Another thing that was very helpful this, and I'm glad you brought up my future, my choice, because that, that brought up memories of staff who've worked with us, is to take the video production team organizationally that kind of sat under a distance learning center lecture capture world, take them out of that and grouping them with the event team. So you get a, because live streaming took off just about the same time as we were evolving with this. So taking video and placing it with the event team was, was you know, one of the better ideas I think that we had regarding to uh, making this function well as a team environment. So just, just some thoughts there. Yeah, our videographer originally was just working with the distance learning classrooms, and then they just kind of started getting pulled in our direction until finally we said, you know what, let's just say you're part of Cabin now. And that's, yeah, that's worked really well for us. Any other questions? Um, our events uh, AV department uh, is now part of facilities, and we have a conflict every summer between facilities and um, the IT side with the, the amount of events that we're booking is keeping us from doing our work in classrooms. Um, do you have that conflict and how do, you, how do you handle it? I really feel like that was a real conflict for us when we were still part of classroom AV and it was just, we were really just sucking resources from the classroom side which I think we all recognized was not what we were wanting to do. And that was really one of the instigating factors towards actually splitting off and being an entirely separate team. So all the staff members are completely different and we just don't touch at all. That being said, we still work very closely together. Every staff member in Cabot originally worked for AV. So if we need to, we can cover each other, but our equipment pools are completely separate. 
And if classroom AV was to run out of something or if a classroom system just dies spectacularly, we can run in there and set up some of our speakers because our speakers are bigger than what they have and we can kind of put together a, a situation or a system that will work for them until we can get it fixed. So there is still a lot of um, communication between the two teams, but I think separating them was really the best decision we made. I don't know if you have anything you'd want to add to that. I think part of it too from where I was sitting was uh, the issue with, as you said, auxiliary services used to support basically all the events. What would end up happening was the event would be not going as ideally planned and then they would run down to AV and Mr. Brian Myers would start looking very stressed out and unhappy because people who were supposed to be dedicated to supporting classroom activities would get pulled upstairs because auxiliary services had said they had everything under control and then 20 minutes into the presentation everything everyone's miserable and we we uh, we had very we had too often frequently stressful conversations about a lack of adequate support for events services on campus and auxiliary services thinking they could handle it when they hadn't actually demonstrated they could do it for quite a long time that was that was a big problem that we were constantly talking about and it wasn't even that we were rushing up to deal with stuff that we knew i mean it was all their own gear so we would just end up in these situations of great i have to make this work i may have not seen this gear before i haven't been trained on this because this isn't my team and it was very difficult to handle it's not pleasant. <laughs> I'm signing you up for my team right there. Um, uh, one of the things that's been as, you know, from where I sit within the organization and look down is the evolution and the quality of the student employees that we've had come through this Cabot team, the AV team, and, and how they, they just, the skill sets. It's like I have a room full of MacGyvers, and you all do, I know you do, but I have a room of people that I can rely on and I can put in front of a customer, in particularly the young man who is sitting under the sign there, his name is Jan Messer, and I don't know where this unit would have been without him because of his flexibility, willingness, teamwork, cooperation, and technical know-how that he can relate to to customers and people within the unit. So I, I kudos to Emily, Niles, Jeff, Brian, Grant, and Brian Myers who hired most of these people and Rick Arnold because it's the evolution of knowing our campus and responding to the event needs that we could have and sometimes they do get big. They do become like this SCAR event and they do become some very high profile events that we have at PSU where they are expected to go perfectly and they don't want to go to an outside vendor. They want to keep it in house simply because of fiscal, fiscal because once they go outside of house to an outside vendor in Portland, the rates will, as you know anyone in Portland, the rates will go up significantly when that happens. Yeah, we have had a lot of luck with our student employees, and Jan is a perfect example. He's been around since the beginning. He was hired by Brian as well as a classroom technician. Um, and we've had a few different notable students like that. I, Jan, the other day I walked in on him, he's building his own paramedic equalizer for fun. I don't know anybody, I can't do that. I don't know what, <laughs> he's an amazing student employee that we're very lucky to have. <laughs> I You've dealt with faculty and faculty as the AV services side, and you've dealt with them as an, and you've dealt with all variety of people as an events person. How would you say the interactions are different between supporting campus, faculty, and and just events in general? And then, what happens if a faculty member comes to you and wants you to support them, and they're at the, they're in a hotel somewhere in downtown Portland? Well, first of all, regarding going off campus, technically we don't do that. We only deal with events on campus. That being said, there have been a few times where our CIO has said, hey, I want you to support this at the Hilton, and then we have to. Uh, but generally, if a professor says, you know, I want you to come over here, we just say no. We just don't have the resources, and I don't feel comfortable having a business model where I send the gear off, because then when it doesn't work, they call me, and I don't want to troubleshoot over the phone. We've just decided that's not our business model. We don't do it. Uh, but as far as our interactions with uh, faculty, um, ha charging for our services definitely sets up a different expectation. And so they, they assume, as they do with Classroom AV though, they assume that everything needs, is going to work perfectly. Um, and I think they are a little bit more strict with us just because of that. 
but at the same time, I think that uh, professors have gotten so used to the high level of service that they get from Brian's team that they do have very s high expectations um, and they really think that there should just be gear everywhere. And that is probably the biggest thing I keep running into. Like, why do they have to pay for something? They have installed gear in their classrooms. Why is there not a similar install system in their event space? Which is a valid question and really it comes back to politics is the reason that there isn't anything in there. Uh, we would love to install gear in our, in our, class, or our event spaces, but at this point, it's just not really happening. I, I don't know if I have a great answer to that. I'm not sure. I mean, there's a lot of similarities, but at this point, I'm dealing more with the administrative side than the actual faculty, which is a very different, very demanding environment. <laughs> I've had a lot of clients recently who have, um, they need events supported that second that I was never informed of, but they think it's okay to just call me up and be like, hey, this is what you're doing today. Um, and I don't know if that happens as much on your side. <laughs> so yeah, it's very different. Well, we will if we have to. I mean, that's a kind of political question. If the president's office didn't tell us that something is happening, we still have to be there. We have to make it work. We've had several situations over the past few months where vital information was not passed on to us, but very high profile things are happening. Uh, sometimes the mayor or the governor's coming and just nobody bothered to tell us. Uh, so we, we do support those, but only if we are confident that we can actually pull it off. If it's a student group that just comes in and says, oh, we were gonna have a meeting and I want a projector to show my PowerPoint, we started 10 minutes ago, then I would probably say no. But if it's a, the president's office, I, I can't really say no as easily. So it really depends on if we even have gear available, if we have personnel around that can run over there that second to do the actual setup. But we do a lot of running around, a lot of last minute support. And I think that's one of our strengths really is that we, we don't say no very often, it's pretty infrequent. We do just about everything that we are asked to if we have the actual capacity to do it. I can see Doug's got something to add to that. <laughs> One of the things that recently has been really resonated, and you saw EMS. EMS is our management billing tool and everything. What happens when these events start up, uh, getting, we get contacted and the rooms don't appear in EMS? And we have a few of those issues right now, and this gets very political, because if you put something in EMS, people are like, does that mean other people can, can schedule my space. We have a few of these in our administrative building called the Market Center building. We have the same issue with certain other venues on campus, the Native American Center uh, Round Room, which uh, Mark is actually working on as a project right now uh, to upgrade the technology within it if they do want to upgrade it. Uh, is the politics associated with making it easier for us? And that's one of the things I think we're, we're trying to address with the clients out there is that, okay, you want us to, we don't know your event's coming. We can't look and do our daily EMS reports and see that, oh, there's something coming. I can be proactive. I can contact them. And so with them not being an EMS, that is a problematic issue that I think we're just starting to address as a problem as we refine us, refine things a little bit better in our world. So, yeah, So we've thanks. been working on more outreach with those specific problematic teams that tend to do that more frequently, it's basically the president's office. Um, and so we, we're really trying to educate them more on how our workflow works and how we can best accommodate them. So we'll go over and train them and just talk to them and say, you know, this is how you communicate with us. Please don't just call one person's desk phone. If that person doesn't answer, maybe call our front desk or maybe email us. Um, and so we also do a lot of trainings and such just to help um, mitigate those situations from arising but it always still happens. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much.